All right. So, uh, is the time for a few questions? Good. Marvellous. Good. Uh, he, he actually wants to ask one as well. He wasn't just. <laughs> yeah, uh, great. Uh, very, very, uh, very poignant, and exactly why I think I, I want to, to run for office. Um, so I got a two-part question. One is how much of your funding currently is coming from government sources? I can answer that one quickly. None. No. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 we are actually in the process of trying to change that, but uh, we, we're not holding our breath. At the moment, virtually all of our funding comes from philanthropy. And two, uh, the, what came up to me was once we achieve this and we have more time, uh, you know, we see often in, in tribal society and then in, in just with people who are, are spoiled with the time, they get into a lot of trouble. And, you know, they start wars when they're not harvesting. Uh, where is, have you, have you put any thought as how we will mm -hmm. prevent that? Okay, yeah, this is an excellent point. And I think one can definitely argue it both ways. My sense is that the strongest uh, influence on people's inclination to violence and so on as a result of all this will be the opposite of what you describe, simply because violence involves risk to life. And the more you value your life, the less willing you are to put it at risk. So, you know, arguably this would mean that people would actually withdraw from violence as the quantity of life ahead of them is increased and therefore the value of life as they perceive it is increased. I think the evidence for that is quite strong in what we've seen in recent history. For example, um, country after country abandoning the death penalty and abandoning um, uh, conscription into the, into the army. For that matter, abandoning um, armed conflict pretty much. You know, the last time there was an actual armed conflict, a proper war, between wealthy countries was World War II. And that is actually the longest interval of time since, you know, since the dawn of history that that's been true. So this is pretty good news. And I think we can see certainly in more prosperous neighborhoods there's less violence. You know, how come? It must be because uh, people don't want to do it, really. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think your um, point about tribal societies is, however, an important one. It definitely bears more research. So, yeah. That's right. Hardly anyone died of aging because they died of other stuff first. Okay. I've always wondered in the Old Testament acknowledging the story when it says that Abraham's wife and child were equal in the world. Mm -hmm. you, therefore, they, they, you know, they lived for generations, lived for thousands of years. Is that literal or is that, can you look at that as a spiritual thing? Uh, is there some thing or some validity that maybe we could look at? I haven't the funniest idea, but I do know that whether it's true or not, um, the way to go about restoring us to that, the, the state that is described there, or better, is one that involves simply you know, biomedical research, and so it doesn't really change anything. Uh, Aubrey, thank you. Uh, first, a statement and a question. I want to tie everything you've said to a very deep-rooted Mormon thought, and that is the uh, Mormon ide ideology is to create a heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that Salt Lake exists out in this 1850s desert is, is to begin that utopian city. And I'm just carrying that idea forward to, to create the, the utopia uh, that you've described. Of course, we do it in terms of brotherhood, fellowship, liberty, and poverty. I, I think but you're right. I, I, I just like to say I think you're right about that, and I don't think it's only the Mormon faith that feels this way. Uh, one thing that I ought to mention that's relevant here is that the precursor of Sense Foundation, the Methuselah Foundation, which was the first organization that I started back in 2002, the co-founder with me of that, it, David Goebel, is a Jehovah's Witness, and they, of course, have somewhat similar beliefs in that regard. Uh, now, now my question, and, and it has a little hint of, of humor to it. Since people will live longer in your objective here. Probably, depending on whether God throws a thunderbolt. Do you, do you see as the ideal 
that we all age pretty much the way we do now and we plateau at age 25, or that the life expectancy of 60 to 80 now simply gets elongated. Therefore, uh, the terrible twos of, that we now have get stretched out for 20 years. The, the, the teenage years of 13 to 19 okay. hit at about age 50, etc. Mm. How do you see that? Yeah, okay, ideal? No, it's a perfectly valid question. Um, and the answer is very simple. Yes, we will, we will basically not have any change in the development period in uh, reaching adulthood. And then after that, people will stay pretty much at the age they choose to stay. So because aging will not be eliminated, but rather it will be repaired periodically, this means that your, your biological age essentially is oscillating between treatments. And exactly how old you biologically are simply depends on how thoroughly and how frequently you have the treatment. Hi, Aubrey. Um, the, uh, there was a, a survey that, was, that, I, that I heard reported on uh, a, a few months ago where only one to two percent of the population expressed any interest in living hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering if there is a, a, a role that you see for the arts to play in keeping people's imagination and in, in enlivening their imaginations to get more interest in that. Mm -hmm which would convert, of course, into more donations to foundations. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a kind of, yes, I, I believe in a kind of pincer movement here. Um, on the one hand, as you've heard, I spend a lot of my efforts ensuring that people focus on the health aspect rather than the longevity aspect. But secondly, I agree that if we could simply get people more comfortable with the longevity aspect, then that would sort of be a pincer movement. Um, and this is important to do because... Try as I may, I cannot stop journalists writing articles about me with the word immortality in the title. The fact is, you know, it, it, they, they, journalists do like to sell papers and they do like to sensationalize this work. So sure, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm emphatically not an artist, so I do not know whether art or indeed humanities in general is really in a position to achieve what you describe. I certainly wish it were. My sense is somewhat pessimistic you know I think it's no accident that films and books about the about a post-aging world um, tend to emphasize you know arbitrary dystopic storylines because it just sort of it it reinforces the pro-aging trance so to speak and thereby you know makes people go away you know comforted and and their views that aging is a good thing and that we shouldn't fix it are entrenched and I think that happens simply because it sells, right? So um, it's all very well to create art that, or, or indeed books or films that um, tell the opposite story, but you've got to make them actually be, you know, you've actually got to get an audience for them, and I don't know how to do that. Hi, I have a comment. I think aging should be part of effective altruism, of course, and that effective altruism is maybe the most important meta idea in the world, and that includes considering things that seem strange to other people, like aging. And I noticed that you yourself, Mr. DeGray, posted a module, I think, on Think, the highimpactnetwork.org. So you seem to know quite a bit about it. I know, I know quite a few of the people in that movement, yes. That's okay, great. That's really cool. In fact, there are about 20 or so meetups, and I'd like to start one in Salt Lake City. And oh. I thought the people in this room might be more likely to be interested. So watch out for that. My name's Adam Eisen, by the way. Excellent. I congratulate you, Adam. That's, that's, a, very, that's a very valuable thing to do. I think that. This movement is still much too small and could definitely benefit. Uh, we have a question from our online participants. And uh, you mentioned um, sort of the, the headlines that you typically see in the media. What would be some of your preferred headlines for advocacy? Preventative medicine for aging is possible. <laughs> Too many syllables, I know. Unfortunately, this needs to be the last question. He'll be around still during life. Yep, yep. So please, um, this will be the last question for both of you. Uh, first, I wanted to, of course, thank you for answering my question. I couldn't answer. <laughs> um, but the other question is, is thoughts in terms of the, the, the more immediate period of this, because obviously you addressed somewhat the question about work in general. But when you look at this research and perhaps what the Sense Foundation itself is doing and the question of patents, and the economics of this and how it spreads beyond some incredibly long-lived rich people. Um, what is, I guess, if you will, the framework that the Sense Foundation has mm -hmm. and yourself in terms of how this work should be done in the immediate term and then in the long term? Within yeah, the, yeah the, hard part, 
Yeah, so, so the answer to your question is easy. The hard part is getting the, quest, is getting the answer ag- acknowledged and accepted by the people who need to. So the answer is, aging is such, so extraordinarily expensive that any therapies that we had that really did constitute comprehensive and effective preventative geriatrics would pay for themselves in no time at all. It would become completely economically suicidal for any nation not to make these therapies free at the point of delivery um, you know, for anyone who was old enough to need them, irrespective of ability to pay. In other words, it would be paid for through taxation. I know that in the U.S. or other, um, you know, signi- um, you know insanely tax-averse societies, um, uh, unlike my own, uh, the, 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 um, con- the, this concept sounds a bit, a bit you know, foreign, but the fact is, you know, it's, it's like basic education. You know, basic education in this country is free too, right? And um, that's because you all know that if you didn't actually educate your kids, then 20 years down the road you'd be screwed. So, um, uh, yes, I mean, the education should be better, of course, than it is, but still, um, it's that sort of logic. The, the, this economic arithmetic does not apply to high-tech medicines of today, and that's why we see, indeed, their availability being restricted by ability to pay. So people just have to understand that. And when I say people, I mean government, obviously, you have to make the policies to make this work. I mean the public, you have to vote the government in. And I also mean, of course, as you were alluding to, the private sector. The whole medical industry has to understand this. There's a bit of a counterintuitive thing here because, of course, at the moment, the medical industry makes its money out of sick people, and the overwhelming majority of sick people are sick because of aging. So so we might superficially think that what we're doing here is essentially destroying the medical industry, and they probably wouldn't like that. Um, But, of course, that's not really true because the medical industry is perfectly capable of developing and uh, and, uh, delivering products that constitute preventative geriatrics if the money's there. Um, So all we really need to do is get society to be on board for preventative medicine for the diseases of old age, and then uh, the industry will follow the money.